Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we're going to be talking about a very uh, misunderstood uh, topic, uh, which are buffers. Now it's been my experience uh, working with OEMs. There's many OEMs and engineers who don't understand what the purpose of buffers are uh, when you use specific ones uh, and under what conditions that you use them. Uh, many people out there like to mess around with buffers. They'll basically, uh, you know, flip around, you know, mix around, you know, mixes and matches of them and Oh, well, my rifle now has a little less recoil. Look what I discovered. Well, unfortunately, uh, I'm sort of going to burst some bubbles here that uh, uh, many people like to mess around with buffers and, you know, they, they discover that, uh, yeah, they can get less recoil and all this. These are wonderful things and they post it on the internet and, uh, you know, and people out there can, can follow. Well, unfortunately, that's very dangerous um, for many of you guys who are law enforcement, military, uh, who use these rifles uh, for personal protection or for uh, combat use. Um, it's very critical that you understand uh, what buffers belong in these rifles and why. <clears throat> because a rifle that works uh, you know, reliably during the summertime all of a sudden may not function at all in the wintertime. So we're going to go over uh, the actual mill spec or Colt uh, design buffers. Uh, now for, again, for anybody out there who likes to mess around with buffers and says, look what I found. Uh, I have a very thick... Um, folder uh, of testing that Colt did over the years on buffer variations, uh, talking about buffer weights uh, versus climatic conditions uh, versus barrels. So I can pretty much tell you that uh, anything that you've messed around with, Colt has done before. Um, the buffers that we're going to talk about here are the actual production ones that go in uh, military weapons. Now there's many manufacturers out there who uh, offer all different kinds of buffers so that are supposedly improvements and, and whatnot. Uh, we're going to go over the ones that would actually come in your rifle uh, from Colt or for F FN or from a mil spec manufacturer who's designed their rifles to function in all climatic conditions. Uh, the first ones we're going to start off with are going to be the rifle buffers uh, and we're going to talk uh, in, in depth uh, about the gen different generations. Okay, starting from the beginning, um, the first rifles were referred to as the Edgewater Spring Guide. This was the original buffer that came out on the original Model 01 uh, rifles. Now keep in mind the original rifles were designed around IMR propellant, which was going to give you a rate of fire around 600-700 rounds a minute. Uh, and for that rate of fire, it did quite well. However, uh, when the military introduced ball powder into the into the mix, you increased your rate of fire from uh, you know around 700 rounds a minute up to nearly a thousand rounds a minute. Well, what that uh, increase in speed did was it caused what's referred to as bolt carrier bounce. What bolt carrier bounce is is when the actual uh, bolt carrier group closes uh, during firing. The bolt will actually close, lock, and then due to uh, the bolt carrier striking the mass of the barrel and uh, barrel extension, you'll have an elastic bounce. The, the uh, carrier will s start to bounce rearward, taking it out just slightly out of battery. So when the hammer comes to strike it, the uh, firing pin cannot reach uh, fully the firing pin, causing it to, to misfire. So basically you have to uh, eject the round out, load another one in, pull the trigger again. So this would cause its major failures during uh, fully automatic fire. So you would have you would have a, a light strike due to the bolt carrier bounce. Uh, so after the 1968 congressional hearings, the standard buffer came out. Well, the difference is, is this is an actual buffer. If you listen, you can actually hear there are five weights uh, and there are five steel weights. That is that is a steel weight, and each one of those weights uh, has a uh, rubber disc in between. So what this does is, is the bolt carrier moves rearward and it goes forward. As soon as the bolt carrier would actually hit the receiver extension, it would uh, absorb that shock and prevent the bolt carrier from bouncing uh, rearward and unlocking and it would keep the, uh, the bolt closed and would allow for reliable uh, function with uh, the higher rate of fire. Now pretty much you know, all the rifles obviously have used this from uh, probably around 1968 uh, to this day. Whenever you're using a, uh, a full-length uh, gas system, a 20-inch barrel, uh, for the most part, uh, you know the receiver extensions are identical between the A1 and the A2. Even though the A2 is an additional five eighths of an inch longer, the buffer actually remains the same length. You actually just have a, uh, a spacer that goes between the rear of the uh, receiver extension and the stock. Uh, but these have been uh, the this has been the reliable one that's been going on for quite some time, um, and is pretty much standard throughout the world. This one here sort of was uh, an embarrassment on Colt's part. Colt decided they were going to do, in the late 90s, a cost-cutting uh, measure. 
And uh, they basically knew that on a semi-automatic rifle, um, the weights have no difference. Well, on the full-length rifle, um, quite frankly, it doesn't because uh, even if you have the bolt carrier bounce, it doesn't make a difference because your finger would never be able to outrun uh, the actual, uh, uh, you know, you know, the ac actual action of the, of the rifle. So they re they realized this. Uh, so they basically made a, a buffer that would give um, enough weight uh, to hold the bolt closed long enough, and the steel weights were not necessary. Uh, for use in, in some automatic now if you were to try to put this in a fully automatic uh, rifle it would not function you would have uh, the, the, the light strikes and it just wouldn't function well Colt got, uh, Colt got a lot of flack from uh, from their customers they're spending a lot of money for these rifles and now all of a sudden they're getting stuff that's not even mill spec so uh, this uh, was a very short-lived uh, cost-cutting measure uh, it did not take long at all for that to be replaced and for them to go back to the original uh, uh, standard buffer which is what they use today. The next one we're going to talk about is the actual hydraulic buffer. Now many of you have seen the anodynes and, and several other of the hydraulic buffers. Uh, well many of them have not, well quite frankly they don't work. Um, they tend to, uh, the seals tend to go and they, they, they don't function. Um, that's why they're not very popular at all for military use. However, uh, during the development of the Colt LMG or light machine gun which was actually done by Dimaco uh, at the time. It was not done by Colt. It was an open bolt machine gun design uh, designed by Colt's Hank Tatro. Um, the initial design was done by Hank Tatro at Colt, but due to uh, many issues that were going on at Colt at the time, including the uh, the strike, which basically shut them down, Colt had no uh, ability to do any engineering work. Uh, so this was uh, sent over to, to Dimaco. And they realized that with the open bolt machine gun, that uh, if they slow down the rate of fire, that would make the thing surgically accurate on fully automatic, which uh, this was the, the result. Uh, this does not use the standard spring. This has a, um, a different spring, which is much shorter, um, and it's, it's designed to work from the open bolt. And this brought the rate of fire down with ball propellant, with, you know, versus it was standard uh, M855 uh, ball powder, ball ammunition and ball propellant. It brought it, brought it down to probably around 700, 800 rounds a minute, and it just purred like a kitten. Uh, accuracy was incredible. However, like all uh, the, the hydraulic buffers, there was issues with uh, the seals the seals breaking. Uh, Dimaco did actually offer a, uh, a, a rebuild kit uh, to rebuild these buffers as well. And uh, this has been probably the, the most successful hydraulic buffer uh, used by the military, uh, not the U.S. military. Uh, Dimaco or Colt Canada has sold these to several of their, uh, their customers. I believe, let me see, Netherlands, uh, Denmark, uh, Norway. Uh, there's, there, there were several countries who have actually bought versions of the open bolt machine gun uh, LMG. Also, uh, they bought the LMG in a, a closed bolt as well, but it still use the hydraulic buffer. Um, my experience with hydraulic buffers has not been good. Um, this one here is, is, is different. This was actually a military grade one where a lot of time and money was put into it to make uh, the best hydraulic buffer that was you know, that could be made. Um, this is sort of a unicorn, let's say. Uh, these are, were manufactured in Canada. Uh, the only product been with the uh, Colt uh, LMGs and, and spare parts. Uh, this would not be something that you would find very very readily. Uh, it just was never um, you know imported. It was pretty much only used in that one model, the Colt LMG, uh, and that was it. Uh, this is sort of a, a good example of the of the standard buffers. Now, people have discovered that if they add some additional weight uh, to these, they can get a little lighter recoil. Uh, however, there are consequences to that. Um, the rifle is really a system. You have a you, know, you have a buffer. You have a buffer spring. You have a bolt carrier. You have a gas port. You have ammunition that has uh, chamber pressures and port pressures. Now, a military rifle has to function in all different kinds of environments. Uh, and if you decide you're going to change something in there, you can pretty much guarantee one of those is going to be thrown off balance, and you're going to have issues. Um, and one of the major issues that comes up is. Uh, you know, people say, hey, uh, this just works beautiful, and I uh, have lighter recoil, but all of a sudden here comes uh, the gun in the cold, and also now it's not working. Um, you may or may not understand or know that um, ammunition functions differently. Its chemical uh, reaction is different between hot weather and cold weather. Um, during your uh, cold weather, you create a much lower port pressure than you do with the standard uh, under regular normal uh, temperate conditions. And when you add that with the additional weight of a buffer, 
you can actually cause the rifle to short stroke or to not have enough uh, port pressure to drive the bolt all the way to the rear or to reload. Um, this is why it's critical for people who are using uh, these guns for LE military purposes that even though there's a lot of neat stuff out there, you stick with what comes in the factory. It's done for a reason. The guns that are, just, are, are coming out of Colt, coming out of LMT, coming out of FN, these guns were designed as military weapons to function in all environmental conditions. And uh, if, you, if you change anything in that system, there can be very severe consequences. Uh, well, this is sort of the reason why I would recommend to anybody who's using these rifles to stick with the mil-spec type uh, buffers, these are the ones that we're going to talk about here. Because there's a reason uh, to the method, uh, to the madness of why these specific buffers were used as opposed to many of the quote improved buffers that you're going to see throughout the industry. You know, for the most part, if you're a, uh, you know, you're just a target shooter, uh, you know, who's using these things for recreational purposes, you know, have at it, do whatever you want. Uh, just make sure whatever you're doing is still safe. Uh, but you guys who are professionals uh, who are working in the, in the in this field, you need to be really careful of what uh, what you put in these guns. The next ones we're going to take a look at is going to be the uh, actual carbine buffers themselves. Things get a little bit more complex here. Now we're going to start with the carbine buffers. Uh, the original buffer that was used in the original XM177s, XM177E2s, was a shorter buffer which had uh, three steel weights. And there's actually a cutout here, cutaway here, where we can actually see what's happening in there. We have the actual rear bumper, which actually strikes the rear of the receiver extension. You can see the actual steel weight and the rubber disc. Then uh, you can see, a, you can, well, you actually can see three uh, steel weights with two rubber discs. And what happens is, as you can see, how these move back and forth. So as the uh, bolt carriers go, or bolts carriers moving to the rear, it's pushing rearward on the actual. Uh, buffers they all shift to the rear then as it goes forward it actually halts uh, the bounce of the bolt uh, carrier um, this worked quite well uh, up until the uh, development of the uh, m4 carbine now the m4 carbine wasn't so much as that uh, the issue came around its rate of fire it came with the actual presentation of the ma55 round into the uh, uh, into the chamber uh, with holding the bolt uh, back long enough for the cartridge nose to be able to, to pick up. Um, when Cole developed the, the, A the M4, there was a couple things that they did to prevent the issue of the um, problem with the round presenting itself in time. The first was the, well, the creation of the M4 feed ramps, uh, which was the extension of the feed ramps uh, that would go uh, into the lower receiver or to the upper receiver. Um, which you could see the difference on the, uh, the barrel extension itself as well as the, the, re the receiver. So that basically cleared it so the M855 round could, could present itself. The second was the creation of the H2 buffer. Now if you look at this buffer, you'll see that there's a couple different colors in here. You have a shiny weight, then you have the, uh, the actual uh, steel. The shiny one is actually tungsten. Uh, tungsten, one tungsten weight is about the same weight as two steel uh, Buffer, uh, buffer weights. So what that additional weight does is it gives a little more resistance when the uh, bolt carrier moves rearward uh, to slow it down just enough and also uh, when it closes on, 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 a, on a higher rate of fire uh, it's additional weight to uh, to halt the, the bolt from moving back. Now however the reason for this was again was to allow for the uh, positioning of the M855 uh, ball round. Now, for as far as the, uh, the issue with the uh, M855 ammunition, only one of these was necessary, either the H buffer or the uh, extended feed ramps. However, Colt kept both. The reason Colt kept both of these changes on the M4, uh, rather than just take the one that was necessary for the functioning, they need to prove to the military that the M4 was not part of the 1968 licensing agreement. That licensing agreement basically made it so uh, everything that was done uh, as a derivative of the M16 was already owned by the US government and therefore Colt could not make any money on it. Uh, so they wanted to show that uh, the M4 carbine had several things that were changed on it that were due to their expenses uh, and that they own it rather than, than the Army. So this was uh, two additional items that were done on the M4 that were different from the standard uh, M16 uh, you know, rifle system, which was, and you know, eventually is what led to the M4 being its own weapons platform, its own, its own family of weapons, as opposed to the M16. As we spoke a little bit earlier, um, we have two different types of buffer weights. We have the steel and we have tungsten. T 
tungsten is significantly more expensive, however, it uh, has much more mass to it. Um, basically, you have one tungsten weight is equivalent to two steel weights, so that enables you to get a much heavier buffer. With a carbine uh, length uh, buffer, you only have enough room for three or three weights in there, that's about it. So uh, the tungsten enables you to increase the, uh, the mass of the, of the buffer when needed. The next buffer we're going to talk about is the H2 buffer. Uh, what H2 means is you have uh, two tungsten weights and one steel. Uh, this was uh, developed uh, during the M4A1 program for SOCOM. Uh, when SOCOM developed the M4A1, it had a uh, much heavier barrel. Um, so basically what was happening with the H buffer was as the buffer was uh, moving rearward and as the bolt would close, there wasn't enough weight there to actually stop the bolt carrier bounce. So if you were to try to fire a heavy barrel, uh, the 14 inch heavy barrel on fully automatic, uh, you would encounter all those light strikes. So by adding the additional tungsten weight, uh, it added enough weight to uh, halt uh, the actual carrier bounce itself within the buffer. So um, that was developed specifically for uh, the heavier barrel. What happens is, is once you, the heavier mass you have up front, the more of a bounce you're going to get off of the, uh, the bolt carrier when it strikes the, the barrel extension. So again, the heavier the barrel, the more uh, elasticity that you get, the more bounce you're going to get back. So when you change your barrel, uh, not so much the length, but the actual uh, weight itself, the heavier you go, the more weight you're going to need to uh, prevent the bolt carrier bounce. Again, this is specifically with firing fully automatic fire. Um, if you were to have that same barrel and you're firing semi-automatic only, you could use a standard buffer. You could use a, uh, um, you know, an H buffer. But for fully automatic, that's why you would need this. Also, you'll see the H2 buffers being used on uh, the external piston uh, type carvings. The reason being is you have a much more violent opening stroke uh, on the uh, external piston or the short stroke tap or long stroke uh, pistons. So what this does is it gives it a little bit more uh, resistance uh, in the beginning before the bolt opens up. Um, you can also see this, for instance, uh, if you look at the inside of a receiver of an external piston gun, you'll see where the, the cam pin itself cuts into the uh, upper receiver. That's a perfect example of you're having a much more violent opening stroke. Uh, and also you tend to have a higher rate of fire with, uh, with the external pistons as well as to, you know, to make them function reliably, generally you have a higher rate of fire. So the H2 buffer is used specifically on heavy barrel and uh, generally external piston guns. I can definitely give you a story regarding this when I worked at Colt. Um, we had an issue with the police department who uh, had, I think it was 10 or 12 rifles that were non-operational and fully automatic. They wouldn't function, but on semi-automatic they were. And uh, they had told us that these were, you know, were, were commandos. Well, uh, you know, we, uh, Johnny, I couldn't figure out over the phone what was going on with it, uh, if it was just one of our commandos. So I had him send in two of the rifles. Well, when we got the rifles back, they were um, Colt upper and lower receivers. However, the uh, barrel itself was a heavy barrel uh, that came out of was Bushmaster. So the problem was they were using a standard H buffer in that rifle. Uh, so when they would fire, fire it fully out of back, you'd have so much elasticity, the bulk carrier bounced back so much it would cause uh, the light strike issue. So all we did was just swap it out with, a, with an H2, and sure enough, it worked fine after that. Um, generally, we would have replaced the barrel and sent it back and charged them for the barrel because they, they altered the gun for our configuration. But to be the nice guy that I am, um, you know, we told them you need to just replace these buffers and, and the rifle should work fine, which they did. The next thing we're going to look at is called the H3. The H3 buffer was designed specifically for one rifle, uh, the Colt Infantry Automatic Rifle. The IAR was actually a 16-inch heavy barrel. Uh, there was a significantly heavier barrel than the SOCOM barrel that was used on the 14 half inch M4A1s. Um, so it was experienced with uh, you know, a massive amount of light strikes uh, due to that, that heavy barrel. Uh, so Colt it was forced to go with the H3, which was three tungsten weights. It's the heaviest buffer that Colt has ever offered. Um, and again, this was specifically designed for uh, the IAR. And this also goes back to environmental conditions. The buffers that you see here were designed for specific uh, weapons. So I, the biggest thing I really want to get forward to you, get through to you guys, is I want you to understand that buffers were designed for certain conditions. And again, those certain conditions are functioning reliably regardless of whether you're in the Arctic or in the desert, uh, in temperate or whatever the weather conditions may be. Because believe it or not, the actual chemical reaction, uh, which 
consists when the, when the, uh, the powder burns under certain um, external conditions has a, has a bearing on the way the rifle will function. Cold weather makes a difference. Uh, it makes a difference on, uh, on, that, on, on the gas pressure for as far as uh, a functioning or liability. Or, you know, liability. Um, I always like giving you guys some kind of examples. When I first built my, uh, my uh, Mark 12 Mod 1, uh, I had, I assumed because it was just a heavy barrel, that I would go with an H2 on it. Well, there was another condition that existed with the, uh, with the Mark 18 barrel that I didn't take into consideration was it was not 16 inches, it was 18 inches, and also the fact that it used uh, a rifle length gas system versus a uh, carbine. So uh, the day that I went to fire, I had, I had the, uh, the H2 in it, and uh, it was probably around 13 degrees, maybe with a negative 30. Every time I would fire, I would get short stroking. And, uh, you know, it was, it was without, without, uh, without, without, a, without a hiccup. Every single one was a short, was a short stroke. Fortunately, that day I had a, I had a POF uh, Puritan out there, which had a standard three-weight uh, carbine buffer. So I swapped out the H2 for that, and sure enough, the rifle worked perfect. Um, since then, I've had that same rifle uh, in the Texas heat, you know, over 100 degrees, and it functions perfect. The Mark 12 required a uh, lighter buffer uh, to function in all weather conditions. Uh, and again, that was a combination of 18-inch barrel, rifle length gas system, as opposed to a 14 and a half inch barrel with a carbine system or a 16 inch with a carbine system. Um, the, again, you have the uh, chamber pressure, you have the port pressure on the barrel, and from the port pressure you have how long the bullet plugs it until it uh, leaves the end of the muzzle. All that works as a system. So again, I'm gonna say again to any of you guys who are professionals who are using your guns in law enforcement or military conditions, leave them alone. Uh, you want to change out your uh, your pistol grip or your handguards, that's one thing. But when it comes to actually uh, impacting the mechanics of the rifle, leave your gun as it was issued. Um, they were designed to work under all conditions. You start messing around with those things, you're going to start messing around with either your life or whoever's going to be carrying that rifle. The last buffer I want to show you is a pretty uh, interesting one. This was only uh, a prototype. This was never actually put into production. Um, Colt had designed it to work with... Uh, their um, XM177s, M4s, uh, the earlier carbines to try to lower the rate of fire. And, uh, you know, it did do that. However, there was a reliability issue with it. Again, you have uh, hydraulic seals in there that would actually come uh, undone. They would actually dry up or they would, uh, they would break, and it would cause the part to fail. Um, so Cole just never went anywhere with it. But it was, uh, it was definitely unique, and especially in the fact you had a flat... Uh, uh, bumper on the back as opposed to the you know the, the current ones but uh, this was rather interesting the next buffers we're going to talk about are the ones for the nine millimeter carbines and submachine guns now this is a rather interesting uh, topic here due to the fact that uh, you see a lot of people who uh, when they mess around with building these these uh, nine millimeters they're swapping around buffers like crazy and I don't think they really understand what the consequences of, of a lot of it are the 5.5-ounce uh, buffer is one of the, one of the heaviest ones that uh, is offered. Uh, it's manufactured out of steel. This additional weight is necessary due to the fact that uh, the 9mm is actually a blowback uh, rather than a gas-operated, so it's the actual weight of the buffer, um, the spring, and the uh, bolt carrier that keeps the uh, bolt closed long enough for pressures to drop so it can safely extract and inject the, the 9mm cartridge case. So. Um, the first one we're going to talk about here is the actual two-piece selective fire uh, buffer. You basically have uh, two pieces. You can see how it's, uh, it's pinned in place. You have uh, a piece of rubber that's inside there. And what this one here does is it allows on fully automatic fire uh, to absorb the shock that's necessary to prevent light strikes. So uh, this one here would specifically be used for selective fire. And of course, it could be fired in, uh, in any of the... Uh, some automatic only variations, but if you were to have a fully automatic, you would you would need to have this uh, particular model right here. The next one, as you can see, is the exact same uh, weight. However, it's a solid buffer. It's one piece. Um, Cole has sold these for many many years in their uh, nine millimeter semi-automatic only uh, carbines. Um, this did come to an end just because there's no point in Colt having two different part numbers for the same thing. Um, however, this one here, if you were to fire this one in a, in a selective fire uh, 9 liter SMG, you would have the issues with the light strikes. Uh, so, you know, when, when in doubt, if you think you're going to be using anything that's fully automatic, you always want to make sure you go to the uh, 
to the two-piece. Now, some changes were made in 2009. Um, Colt never finalized the design of the 9mm submachine gun. Uh, they never wanted anything that was going to compete with their M4, um, and they didn't really sell a lot of uh, the 9mm SMGs. Uh, they only made them once a year. So they never really uh, finalized them. In 2009, uh, while I was there, we were uh, in Jamaica, where we had a, a major failure uh, with, uh, well, one was uh, the bolt came back so far, a uh, fire cartridge case uh, went into the trigger compartment and got lodged in between the trigger compartment and the, and the bolt itself. Um, and the reason it was able to do that was because if you look at the overall length of a nine millimeter bolt versus a, a standard bolt, you have actually probably another half in, or half inch to an inch uh, that sticks out from the, the face of the carrier uh, for the uh, bolt. Well, and when that locks open on its last shot, that stops right near uh, the bolt catch. Well, with a nine millimeter, you have that open, you know, half inch or inch or so space. And what that does is it uh, not only does it give additional time for the bolt to accelerate before it impacts the bolt catch, but it also leaves that uh, trigger compartment open. So, uh, well, we and we had had both. We had had uh, the, the issue with uh, the uh, our cartridge getting stuck, um, as well as we had uh, you know some issues with some of the light strikes. Well, when we got back to Colt, we finally were able to get them to do some research into it. They did some high-speed video, and they figured out what, what we told them was going on. And uh, the solution uh, was mainly a spacer. It was a half inch long or so spacer that went in the rear of the uh, buffer spring. So when uh, the bolt came back on the nine millimeter, it would stop at the exact same location as the standard 5.56. What that did was that it kept the uh, trigger compartment covered at all times, and it also, um, the bolt stopped right before uh, the bolt catch, which eliminated the time of acceleration uh, from from the time it was to the rear of the, of the uh, rear worst most position to its uh, closing on the on the bolt catch. And this was made a major difference in, in breaking bolt catches. Uh, this, this, was, this was really big for that. Now there have been companies that have actually made longer buffers, um, which is definitely a good idea, but you need to make sure that you're still in the 5.5 ounce uh, weight. Um, I have seen people with carbines who have put regular, uh, you know, three steel carbine buffers in the, uh, and, and nine millimeter carbines, and this was dangerous. Um, they liked it because it increased the rate of fire. The other, the other problem that it had with it was, is when it fired, the bolt would actually start to move rearward, and the rear of the nine millimeter cartridge case would be unsupported, and you would see like a beveling or a, or like a a swelling, uh, you know, right right in front of the the rim of the nine millimeter cartridge case. Well, this is rather dangerous. Um, that is that's why you have to understand how everything works together. Uh, to make a reliable firearm. So you need to stay with the proper weight buffers uh, to have the gun function reliably. I would always recommend that, uh, you know, even if you have, uh, you know, one of these standard nine millimeter buffers, uh, take about a bucket or a buck and a half and quarters, uh, stick it in the back of your receiver extension. What that will do is it'll give you that extra half inch there. Uh, so you're gonna shorten up that gap between the uh, nine millimeter bolts and the, uh, the bolt catch, and that will eliminate your issue with having, you know, to deal with, first of all, the uh, acceleration issue it would cause the bolt catch to break, and also it would make sure that your trigger compartment was covered at all times. That's one very easy and very harmless uh, improvement that you can make to that to that carbine. The last ones we're going to show you here uh, are actually, um, when the assault weapon ban came, they could, no, you know, Cole could no longer sell the, uh, you know, the telescopic stock versions of the 9mm carbine. So they had to go with a full length stocks. So the, a buffer was modified uh, to get it up to the weight that it needed to be. So basically what you have here is a standard buffer, which inside you have seven uh, steel weights, and then you have the rubber uh, uh, buffers in there. Um, and what that did was that made this, this, uh, this, bu this buffer itself suitable for use in a uh, full length stock receiver extension. Uh, you can pretty much tell these uh, because when you, when you shake them, you don't hear anything uh, because they're pretty much compacted in there. And second of all, Colt usually would just hit, some, hit it with some spray paint uh, black to identify it as a nine millimeter uh, carbine buffer. So again, if you were to have a, a full length stock in a nine millimeter, you need to make sure that you have the proper buffer. 
uh, I don't believe I've ever seen anybody make this uh, this buffer here outside of Colt. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't believe I have. Uh, that's certainly not saying that they're not out there, but uh, for safety reasons, I would make sure that uh, if you do have that, that you have the proper uh, buffer. Now, Colt has done uh, some other ones as well. Um, for instance, for the 222 uh, Remington that they made for Italy, uh, there's some countries that couldn't have uh, U.S. military weapons or uh, military calibers. Uh, so instead of going with the 223, they had to go to the 222. What they did was they took the standard carbine buffer and they uh, took all the weights out of it and just and just put it and they put one on each side. So one on the one side of the spring, one on the other side of the, of the buffer spring, and that lightened it up so it would it would, it would function properly with the uh, lighter uh, impulse of the 222. Let's give you a top a top view here of how you identify um, what the buffers are. The unmarked is the standard carbine buffer with three steel weights. The H means two steel, one tungsten. H2 means one steel, two tungsten. And H3 is uh, three tungsten. I'm going to do a quick recap on why you, you know, when you use what. For semi-automatic only direct impingement rifle, uh, you're, you would go with the uh, standard carbine or the H. H I tend to uh, favor just due to the fact that uh, there are a lot of rifles that don't have the extended M4 feed ramps and with some of the projectile tips um, it's just a better it's just a, a better reliability enhancement to keep with the H. The H2 is for use only with heavy barrels uh, and with uh, ones that are external piston short stroke or long stroke. Now again you're not going to see a lot of the differences uh, with a non-piston rifle just due to the fact that uh, it's, if they're semi-automatic only However, if you're firing select to fire, you will see a difference between a heavy barrel and a standard barrel. Uh, the bulk carrier bounce will cause um, failures to fire. If you have a piston gun or an external piston gun, I highly recommend it uh, just to try to save some wear and tear on the uh, on the inside of the upper receiver. And uh, the H3 is a very limited uh, use buffer. Um, it is only under on the, on the most ex extreme circumstances of having a heavy barrel. Um, for instance, again, Colt had the IAR, a 16-inch massively heavy barrel. Uh, that's what it that's what it was used for. Um, now, with its weight, uh, you probably could get away with using it for a nine millimeter. Uh, however, I would not recommend it. That's not what it was designed for. It was designed uh, for a very specific purpose. Um, all of these uh, buffers are available at Brownells uh, in all these different configurations. Now, many people who, who build these rifles, uh, you know. You look at the parts and say, yeah, they look the same, so they probably are the same, and that's uh, the farthest from the truth. Um, everything that you see, uh, you know, here, every every buffer here is different. It was designed for a different purpose. Um, again, for you guys who are experimenting, you're messing around on the range and everything. You know what? Do whatever you want. Uh, you know, it's 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 not as critical there. You can experiment, uh, but for you guys who are uh, in military law enforcement or who are using these guns for self defense, stick with what comes with the gun. There's a reason for it, and if you're building the guns, um, like I said, if you're using a 16-inch direct impingement barrel, a standard or an H, prefer the H. If you're uh, doing selective fire, that's when uh, a lot of the H and the H2 and the H3 come into play. You guys who are building 9mm, granted a lighter buffer will give you a higher rate of fire, and I know some of you guys would like that, however, it is not safe. Your, uh, your bolt is actually opening prior to uh, the, ch the pressures that are, that are dropping. You need to stay with uh, the 5.5 ounce steel uh, buffers. And I would recommend, uh, you know, I know uh, Brownells also sells uh, the spacer that Colt uh, produces uh, to put in the back, so at the back of the, the recoil spring. Again, that is an awesome uh, improvement. Uh, it takes care of, the, uh, you know, many, many of the issues that come along with uh, bolt catches breaking and uh, cartridge cases going into the trigger compartment. Um, it'll also help a little bit with the uh, wear on the, um, on the hammer pins themselves. Uh, nine millimeter hammer pins is one of the uh, most frequently broken part. Um, it's just very important that you uh, understand what your circumstances are, uh, what environments that you're going to be in here in southeast Texas. You don't have to worry about cold weather too much. Um, however, in New York, uh, when I was living there, yeah, we had we went from the, you know the hundreds down to the negatives, and uh, and I had a perfect place where I could actually see the differences of uh, of how a weapon will function. The same rifle, the same system with the same ammo under two very different climatic conditions. Um, but I can always say if I had the proper bu proper buffers in there that came with them, I had never had a hitch of any of the weapon systems that I ever used uh, going from one condition to the other. 
Uh, if you have any questions or anything, please uh, list in the comments down there, and I'll try and get back to you. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video, and uh, if you did, please click like and please subscribe. Thank you.